I'm not following you showing. I have a full oh, internet is... connection. Okay. Oh. All right. Welcome to class, oh, everybody. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the exciting book of Ecclesiastes. Oh. And um, I want you to notice how cool my picture is. Isn't that a cool picture? Yeah. That's downtown Nashville from yesterday. Really? Yes. <laughs> and that's fog. That yeah. You're seeing rising What's up. the red? Wow. Uh huh. Wow. Is that a red fog or? Oh, down there? Yeah. I don't know. Not all the fog comes from the sky. It could be coming from it's, smoke. It's probably light reflecting off of it. I kind of figured it was light reflecting off of it. Maybe uh, huh. sun reflecting. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Hmm. All the right. Huh. You're sanitizing. A little bit of information about Ecclesiastes. I did not bring my notes. So we'll see how all I do. All right. Okay. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Ecclesiastes is attributed to Solomon. And if you look at the very beginning of the book, you can see why, because um, he kind of identifies himself as the teacher who is the son of David and a king. And so that's generally assumed to be Solomon. But one of the things we remember from Solomon, too, is that he accumulated information. So um, so it's possible that he's reporting what someone else has taught, but we think most of these words are from him. So because it's attributed to Solomon, then it's also attributed to the kingdom era, um, because that's the period during which Solomon lived, right? But in 1 Kings mm -hmm. is where we see the story of Solomon. And that was about 950 B.C., um, somewhere in that. He probably This is probably um, written towards the end of his life. Um, and, and it's generally after he's experienced a lot of life in, um, and maybe has learned some lessons the hard way during that time, right? So when we talk about genre, um, it's one of the poetry books, but it's also one of the three wisdom literature books. Do you remember what the other two were? Um, well, Psalms and Proverbs. Proverbs and what? Psalms? No, no, that's Psalms is poetry. That's oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. What did you say, Jen? Job. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes are generally considered the books of wisdom literature. And so, um, so good memory. All right. And if we talk about the purpose of Ecclesiastes, then we also see um, this is the verse that I would pick out to, rep to represent it which is um, to teach that true life comes from fearing the Lord and following his commandments. Amen. But we'll actually read that verse a little bit later. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you remember if I had anything else to say about Ecclesiastes? But I'm guessing that's a good thing. Um, Ecclesiastes actually means um, teacher of the assembly. And so, uh, or sometimes that's a tribute. That's... Um, interpreted as preacher so this was this is a book then that's meant to be delivered to the church basically to the assembly um, and so you can use it in different ways usually when we think about ecclesiastes this is what we think of the verse that says meaningless meaningless says the teacher utterly meaningless everything is meaningless have you heard that before mm -hmm. yeah okay. it has with no meaning yeah <laughs> it has no meaning but um, here's the interesting thing. Meaningless is uh, our modern translation of the word. The word is actually hevel, H-E-V-E-L. And in Hebrew, that's pronounced almost like a B, hevel. Um, and hevel doesn't necessarily translate to the word meaningless. Um, instead, it translates more like the word smoke. So what I want to do is... Um, illustrate something for you. Okay, just a minute. I should have read this already. I've got a question. Now. Yes. If Solomon was the wisest, okay. why did he have like okay. a thousand talking pines and stuff? Well, he started no. out being wise, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he lost it. And, you know, my theory on that is sometimes people get too big. Too big for their britches, right? Because with all the wives he has, he has mother-in-laws, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they came into play, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of his 
uh, he had a lot of concubines too. And, mm. so, um, and really that was Solomon's downfall, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And so not wise enough to do things the right way. So I have my candle burning. And this is not going to be a great illustration for me probably, but, but I want you guys to watch what happens when we blow it. Okay. <laughs> Tell me what you see. Smoke. Smoke. Define it. What is smoke like? Ethereal. Ethereal. Ooh. Anybody have any normal words? That's a big word. Suspended mm-hmm. particles of moisture and soot. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing now. You asked me to find it. Yeah. So how else would you describe smoke like that? Without specific form. Without form. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gone was, in a moment. It was fleeting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can. Can anybody smell kind of the remnants of the smoke? No, I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. it well, that. you're right there. Yeah, I am. Awesome. So it didn't really dissipate. have um, mm-hmm. a steady shape. It changed well, it over dissipates. time. It dissipates mm-hmm. and it's vague. And so, so that's that's really the word hevel. Mm-hmm. It means shifting, like smoke or fog, um, or um, that sort of thing. So it's not something that you can grab onto. Um, I had a whole list of descriptions for it. But <laughs> So, um, anyway, so I want to think about that instead of thinking about meaningless, think about shapeless or um, and it doesn't stay the same time and it's not something that you can hold on. And that's really the word behind um, the scripture when Solomon says that everything is meaningless. Everything that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Immaterial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Without substance. So, um, so given mm-hmm. that, then, um, what I thought we would do is look at a few of the themes that we find in the book of Ecclesiastes. So, Ecclesiastes itself, remember, it's poetry, and it's actually several pieces of poetry kind of put together and then summarized at the end. So, so these would have been different, maybe different poems. And when you're reading chapter to chapter, you'll see that that the like chapter three might be completely different than chapter two. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily a continual story or even a continual teaching. Mm-hmm. It's different b- books of poetry that are grouped together. Okay. Sort of like Proverbs, but with all the chapters. Yes, yes. And there's only 12 chapters in Ecclesiastes, and it's the 21st book of the Old Testament. So um, I forgot those from the screen ones. <laughs> and that's the opposite of 12. Yeah. <sighs> I think that happened by chance, but I could be wrong. (laughs) Numerology would say no, that's on purpose. So one of the Mm. first themes that we see in Ecclesiastes is this theme of time marches on. So time goes on and on and on. And 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 actually what we're gonna see is there are some of these concepts that we hold on to that we think are really big deals, but the truth is they're kind of heavy. Right, mm-hmm. and so so in the same way, time goes on and on. So so we learn then that our existence is just a blink of the eye. You know, it's just a little fraction of time when you consider the whole span of time, span of time, right? And and so in the creation of the universe um, and eternity, it, you know, time goes on and on and on. And what seems to us to be a lifetime is really just a tiny bit of time. And so I think that's an important thing to remember. And you'll see, I think it's in, it's either chapter one or chapter two, that talks about the sun rises and the sun sets, and then the sun rises again. You know, the days just go on and on, and it's a predictable thing. Um, and so, um, and also it says streams flow to the sea, but the sea never overflows. You know, it, um, not talking about flooding, but, but it doesn't run out of sea, right? Can somebody read verses 9 through 11 from chapter 1? History mere, merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. 
will, we don't remember what happened in the past and in the future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. That's kind of an ouchie, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You might think you something, but you're not. I know, right? And so even if you think about, like, think about your great-great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know who those were, or maybe you don't. You don't know what they had for breakfast mm -hmm. one morning, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't really know. In most cases, we don't know what people are like. And then you go back 200 years, we don't know those people, right? So isn't it, does it help you to put things into perspective, to think mm -hmm. that, we get so bound by time right now in a hurry a lot. We feel a sense of urgency a lot. And what Solomon is saying is chill, right? Time marches on. It goes on forever. And, and there's nothing new under the sun. One of the things I loved when I was reading through here is how many phrases that I've said that I didn't know that came from Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. right? And so that whole there's nothing new under the sun yeah. um, is one of those. We like to think that we have new things, you know, like maybe microwave ovens and internets are new, but, but nothing of significance, right? Communication is still communication. Lust is still lust. Sin is still sin. There's really nothing new under the sun. All right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Our next one is that there are some pursuits that are really kind of useless. These are Hevel also, all right? And one of those is pleasure. Can somebody read verses 1 and verses 10 and 11 from chapter 2? I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. And then you said 10 and 11? Yeah. Anything I wanted I could, would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work a reward for my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Thank you. So um, Solomon will use that phrase, it was like chasing the wind. He uses that a lot. And so um, you'll see that phrase come back again. I need to send an invite to my Um, and then the first one, chapter two, and these are just kind of examples, but you'll mm -hmm. see that there are really more um, examples than that. I think those uh, scriptures, kind of, um, like chasing the wind, that kind of um, explains the 3,000 wives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon was definitely, he got to that place, didn't he, where he was going after maybe, pleasure in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe he was flat, John. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right. I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. So let's see, what was our next one? What else is useless? <laughs> okay, next is wealth that's useless, all right? Mm -hmm. Somebody else read from chapter five, verses 10 through 12, and six, one. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? And then six one. Does that right here have an IV or something? That's what <laughs> Am I the only one with the King James? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. So that was, uh, oh, go ahead and read number two. God Verse gives two. a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them. 
and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. All right. I like how that in the first one that you read, um, the NLT says, uh, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, so, and then here, so here's what his point is too. You can't take it with you. You remember, have you ever heard that mm -hmm. saying? That's yeah. really what he's saying. Yeah. So if you work really hard to accumulate this massive estate and all of the things, mm -hmm. you're working hard to leave something to someone else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's why he's saying it's meaningless. It's not like you can take it with you. You're just working hard so that they can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and that I think verse 12 said that people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. you know, why would the rich seldom get a good night's sleep? It's always worried about his money. And yeah. it's gonna take it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, lots to worry about mm -hmm. and we got more work to do and uh, and all that. So, does that run contrary, do you think, to what our culture thinks? Well, there's a rap song that said more money, more problems. <laughs> I think that's right in line. That's, that's like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's wise teaching. Hmm. All right, and then um, also knowledge. Now, knowledge is this is really talking about human knowledge. All right, mm -hmm. so go back to chapter one and read verses sixteen and seventeen. I thought to myself, "Look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me." I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. Yeah, there you go. So he's not saying that God's wisdom is hevel. He's saying that um, maybe that knowing what the snail darter is or um, mm -hmm. all of that stuff is really not that helpful and I, I like how I think this is where you see Solomon putting his life into perspective that he's looking back over these things and he's pursued knowledge all these years and then he's like really it wasn't that big a deal there wasn't it didn't do what he thought it would do and so maybe that's because he stopped applying it um, but God is always um, valuable and so I think this is more about knowledge all right and then if we want to have the right perspective instead let's go to 518 verses um, 18 to 20. it says even so i've noticed one thing at least that is good it is good for people to eat drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life god has given them and to accept their lot in life and it is a good thing to receive wealth from god and good health to enjoy it to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to come back to that um, a little bit too. But, um, but I think the point here is um, to accept one's lot in life. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and so it, we've talked before about how acceptance makes such a difference that when our ex when we have false expectations. Um, it makes life more difficult, right? It right. seemed that, he, that uh, Solomon didn't accept his lot in life. Yeah. He didn't learn that. He learned about it, but he didn't live it. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's right. He just, went, he just went for more and more and more. And, and by this time, he's already got bitter and angry. Yeah. So yeah. he learned it for others. So Okay, so there's a couple of things we've got. One is time marches on. The next is that a lot of the pursuits that we think are valuable as humans are really not, right? And then here's the next truth, that um, death is for certain, all right? So um, death comes to the wise and the foolish. Let's look at chapter two, and we'll look at verse 16. Bill, can you do that one? For the wise and the foolish both die, 
die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. <laughs> yeah, everybody dies, right? Okay, and going down, go and read 18 and 19. Wait a minute, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't say that. <laughs> well, no, I didn't include 18, and I just, oh, okay. I didn't do the whole chapter. I don't think that, oh yeah, this one says pretty much the same thing. 18 and 19? Yeah. I came to hate all of my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I have earned. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. That's sad, isn't it? That's, a, that's the same point we were making about acquiring wealth. It's that after your death. Um, well, Solomon's advice in six was to enjoy what God gives you. And he's very clearly talking about what he did, mm -hmm. not what God did. Yeah, Solomon worked hard, don't you think? Hmm. I mean, I think, I think he... Well, he took the giftedness that God gave him and blessed him with and took ownership of it and stopped giving God credit for it. Yeah, yeah, good point. All right, somebody read 3, 19 through 21. Okay. What happens to, for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage of the beast for all is vanity. All that one place, all are from, are from dust, and dust, and to dust all return. Oh. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes on, upward and the spirit of the beasts go down to the earth? Yes. All right. So he's saying that men and animals have the same fate, right? They die the same way. Animals die the same way we do, and uh, and, you know, Solomon doesn't have um, an understanding of heaven the way that we do, too. So he says, who knows what happens to their souls afterwards. But from his observation, men and animals both end up the same. Okay. All right. And then the other is that death is our destiny. Greg, can you do seven, two? Okay. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. <laughs> All right. Tyson, can you do 9 verse 2? This is a real positive message. In English. <laughs> do it in English. It gets, it gets better. <laughs> okay, which English do you prefer? It doesn't matter. Just whatever you're doing. No, Alan. We want to see what King James does. <laughs> I do, do. <laughs> You want the queen? He said nine, two. Nine, nine two. Yeah. Nine, verse two. Okay. <coughs> all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. To the good and to the clean. And to the unclean, to him that sacrifice, and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth, as he that feareth an oath. Thank you. Yeah. So mine starts out with saying destiny ultimately awaits everyone. And that's what that's saying, right? And then even the first part of the next verse says, it seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. Mm -hmm. and so, do we ever get that kind of attitude? Like, you know, we get really upset when we lose somebody, you know, and that just doesn't seem right. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, everybody dies, right? Huh. And because time marches on, if someone dies at 50 instead of 70, for us, it's a great tragedy, right? But ultimately, we all go to the same place. We all end up in the grave, right? <laughs> so it is very gloomy. This is a very gloomy outlook, yeah, isn't don't it? Don't you feel good, Alan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
let's hope that we don't lose Jennifer right now. <laughs> and Violet, we want you guys to stay on because it's getting better, okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny that you pair this with yeah. the Song of Solomon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should have done it at the same time, right? <laughs> we, yeah, we talk about death and then we talk about love. love. Right. Yeah. All right. So now here's the next concept. Okay. So what have we learned so far? Time marches on. A lot of our pursuits are useless. Um, death comes to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then this next one, life is random. Right? There is a certain amount of randomness. That <coughs> Susan, can you read three verses one through eight? Yeah, the birds do it much better though. Yeah. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear, tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? Keep going? That was it. Okay, all right. So what's the point of that? Well, time for everything. So I guess in the car when I said, when, when you said that, I just live the last words, and I said, everything is bandaged. Well, in my Bible, it says everything is fantasy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In your Bible, it, I don't know what it says, but it probably <laughs> doesn't say that. It says meaningless, I think. <laughs> what does the word for gain from this toil, I guess? Huh. That's the next part. Huh. But it's all heaven, yeah. right? Huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. It all comes back to that same Hebrew word, whether hmm. it's vanity or useless. Meaningless, some of them say useless, and then others say, well, and so there is there's a time for everything and so sometimes like when we're in the winter and we long for the time of mm -hmm. growth and yeah um, spring yeah and spring it's not time for that right yep. just just wait it'll get there it might happen right, right. you I'm mean there's no climate change no <laughs> uh. it's always everything's always changing yeah, it's always changing. There you go. I like that answer. All right. So then outcomes don't always make sense, too. That's the other thing that we notice as a part of that randomness. So verse 16 says, I also noticed that under the sun there is evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. Um, so he's saying judgment comes and does, and sometimes it's just and sometimes it's not. <coughs> mm -hmm. And then we go over to 814, and it says, um, and this is not all that is meaningless in our world. In this life, good people are often treated as though they were wicked, and wicked people are often treated as though they were good. This is so heavenly, right? So, is that true? Have we seen that in life? Yeah? So you remember, this is why we said that Job was so important. <coughs> um, because what we saw in the book of Job is, even though Job did everything right, he still suffered. And so we learned in Proverbs that uh, all the Proverbs are kind of like, if you do it right, you won't suffer. But then there's also this sense there that these are general guidelines that life doesn't always work that way. So between Job and Proverbs and now Ecclesiastes, what you see is that it doesn't always end up like it should. That sometimes good people are persecuted and sometimes bad people are rewarded. And I think that's probably a wisdom that we've all seen in life as well, right? Yeah. And that was especially radical during Solomon's days when they were very well convinced that if life was going good, it's because you were good and God was blessing you. Um, and, so, and if we're not careful, we can get into that expectation. Now. But it's really important for us to understand what Solomon's saying is that it doesn't always make sense and it doesn't always work out that way. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. And so, um, 
who wants to read verses uh, from chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Are you in it? Are you in the scripture, Alan? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so can you read that one? Sure. It's actually one of my favorites. Yes. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Amen. Yeah. That's a, um, that's a verse that we quote a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Time and chance happen to all. So, so sometimes just stuff happens, right? Stuff. That's how oh. stuff happens. Okay. Mm. It does. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so I think we tend to have an idea of God <coughs> as being some kind of cosmic engineer sometimes and um, making everything happen. But what this says is that sometimes it's just, it just does. And it's just a part of living in this world, and especially in a fallen world, that we all face things that we might not have. But the, the good part about this is it doesn't preclude God working in a person's life. Mm -hmm. Amen. It doesn't mean God's not involved right. at all. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's, um, let's look at what is good then. So chapter 2 Talks of, and I think we've seen this. You see this in different places, too. So I hope I picked a good one to represent. Um, but it talks about that work still has value, right? Sister, are you there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do 20, verses 24 and 25. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see is from the hand of God. But without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Right. So, um, and this, and we, when we combine this with other verses too, you see more of this pattern that work in order to gain wealth or to gain status or power is meaningless. But there is an intrinsic value in work that you can still work and find satisfaction. This is a principle that I find that I find <clears throat> operating in all of our lives, that it's good for us to work or have some purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it can be very depressing when you don't have a job to do or a way, an outlet for your energy and your thinking and that kind of thing. And so what we see throughout scripture is that work is good and um, it's not a bad thing. And sometimes work seems like a four letter word, right? You know, <laughs> But it's a good four-letter word. And sometimes work isn't paid. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. Yeah. And yeah, so, Paul said if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Yeah. Yep. There you go. <laughs> I think there's just something in us that feels satisfaction when we do something, even if it's cleaning the house or um, doing the laundry. I haven't found that. You know? <laughs> I feel very satisfied when the house is clean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with someone else doing it. I'm okay with you doing the work. All five minutes of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's five minutes. <laughs> Hang in there. Pick up the dog and say, well, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another thing that's good is companionship. Two people are better off than one so they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Amen. I like that, because it reminds us that God doesn't mean for us to go through life alone, right? And that doesn't have to come through a spouse. That can come through friends or family. And, and you get this picture here of somebody fighting, like, you know, mm -hmm. and if, if you have two people, they can put their backs together and protect all the way around, right? Even better if you have three. So I think this is a piece of wisdom that we can apply to our lives that God doesn't mean for us to go through it on our own. And um, it's good to have companions to go through life with, all right? And he also talks about obedience um, being good. 
And 8 verse 5 talks about obeying the king, uh, which is funny because the king is who's writing it. Obey the king since you vowed to God that you would. And it goes on to say that life is better when you do things the way the king would. Those who obey him will not be punished. And those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. So it's better to obey the king because um, life goes better, right? All right. And then God's ways are to be obeyed too. Greg, can you read 8 verses 12 and 13? Okay. But even though a person sins a hundred times and still lives a long time, I know that those who fear God will be better off. The wicked, said, yes, one more. The wicked will not prosper, for they do not fear God. Their days will never grow long like the evening shadows. Okay. So, um, so obedience to God's ways, still, I like how it says that their life will go better. They will be better off, right? So those things are good. So we find then that even though there are some things that are useless, things like work and companionship and obedience to God's ways are still good, right? So there are good things. But ultimately what we find is that God is good, right? right. Amen to that. <laughs> God is good. And these are the observations of Solomon. So let's look at um, 5 verses 2 through 7. So are you ready to read again? I'm not there yet. You said chapter 5? Yes. What verses? Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. <clears throat> After all, God is in heaven and you, you are here on earth, so let your words be few. Too, too much activity gives you restless dreams. Too, too many words make you a fool. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through, for God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. <clears throat> don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry, and he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap, like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. What's that? Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> I think the NIV says to stand in awe. Stand in awe. Yeah. God. yeah. And so, so God is to be feared, right? And what we say to God matters, right? Um, somewhere in here, I don't think I included it, it says it's better not to make a vow than to make a vow and break it. That's what it said. Right? Yeah. Yeah, is that the yeah that, that's, okay. in, that's in what I read. It, yeah. And I'll keep those promises, keep all the promises you make to him. So there's, God is good, but there's also something that is um, to be feared there that says you know, we should take our relationship with him seriously. Okay. Um, man, that's a good thing to remember, isn't it? Right. I like it where it says talk is cheap. Yeah. <laughs> it's useless, isn't it? I've actually lived by that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my life. Yeah, actions speak louder than words. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the um, the internet, right? Mm -hmm. That came and saw your internet. <laughs> right. Tyson, right. right. could you read eleven verse five for us? Eleven. Yep. Chapter eleven. Eleven. Yep. Chapter eleven, verse five. You sure there's a chapter eleven? Mm -hmm. There's twelve. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> maybe the King James. Maybe uh, maybe I have some pages oh, ripped out or page. something. <laughs> Turn backwards one. No. So so, uh, uh, you're in Song of Songs there. Oh. Oh, quick. Oh, you're in Song of Songs. You're in Song of Songs. Oh, you're in Song of Songs. She did. I'm in Song of Songs. Yeah, keep going. 
Jennifer, we'll let you read the next one when we get there, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Eleven times. Well, yeah. let her go Eleven ahead and times. read this one. That's all right. Mm -hmm. We'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> I know. Right here. You're no, that's Ecclesiastes. That's what we're in. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, I thought we were in the zone of zone. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, okay. Which, which verse is it? Five. Eleven. Mm -hmm. Eleven. Five. Yeah. Okay. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bone do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou <coughs> knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Thank you. Very good. The NLT says you can't understand the activity of God who does all things. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the other point. So first we've got we need to be in awe of God and watch our words to him. And next we've got don't think that you can understand everything that God does. And um, and we even understand like more now about how a baby grows in its mother's womb than Solomon did then. Right? But even then, we can't presume to understand things the way God does. Right? And I think that's the most important thing to me to yeah. take from this is don't ever think you can or ever will on this earth understand the ways of God. Yeah, that's, is a who last, he is. that's the last chapter of the joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. All Where right. were you when I did this? Um, yeah, very good. Jennifer, can you read 7, 11, and 12? Wisdom is good, but an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun, for the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Mm, very good. I like how the NLT says that last one. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Amen. Wow. And then um, who wants to read 8, 16, and 17? <clears throat> I have it. Okay. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing, sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Yeah. So same point, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't think you understand it all. All right. But then here's the next point that we need to find God before it's too late. Mm -hmm. So let's look at, um, I'll read verse 12, or 12 verse 1. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Mm -hmm. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. So better to find God when you're young than to wait till you're, um, out of pleasure or fed up to find God. And then verses six and seven. Yes, remember your creator now while you were young before the silver cord of life snapped and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. I'm pretty sure that sounds differently in the NIV. <laughs> it's pretty close. But yeah, so don't wait until you're too old to enjoy it <coughs> to find God who will bring you satisfaction and pleasure in life in ways that are meaningful, right? Um, it's like waiting until you're too old to dance to learn how to do it, right? <laughs> All right. And then that brings us to this conclusion. Alan, will you read uh, from chapter 12, verses 13 and 14? And that, but notice the, um, if your Bible is headed like mine, after, chapter, after verse 7 and 12, it says, concluding thoughts about the teacher. And so it looks as though this part was even added um, perhaps after Solomon's writings. So that um, so it's like someone is summarizing what Solomon has said. If you'll read those last two verses. Please. Yeah, the title in NIV is Conclusion of the Matter. Yeah, okay. But 13 starts, uh, Now all has been heard 
Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So in a place where Solomon finds so many things meaningless or hevel, what he is saying is that find God and, and do fear the Lord and obey his commands because that's what has meaning. He's using the old parent approach. Do as I say. Yeah. <laughs> do as God says, right? Well, no, he says do as I say because he didn't actually get it. Yeah. <laughs> He understood it, but he didn't get it. Yeah. So, so what do you think about Ecclesiastes, either through our study tonight or other times? What do you What do you learn about life through all of this? Fear God and keep His commandments, and it will go well with you all of your days. Give her a star. Yes. There you go. Your memory verse. <laughs> the way I sum up Ecclesiastes is. Without God, everything is meaningless. Yeah. The only thing that really matters. And, and it's like, um, it reminds me of that, the scripture about building your house on the sand. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And, and I think it's a lot like that, that if we want wisdom or satisfaction with life or joy or anything, you know, it all starts with that foundation, foundation. of God. And, uh, and other anything, if your life is built on anything other than God, it's like building a house on sand. It's not going to stand up. And so I think that's a good conclusion. I think there's another approach that, that also works, and that is uh, instead of trying to accomplish things, be with the people in your life. Yes. And so the enjoy your times with your family and your friends and enjoy the food you get and the, the provisions mm -hmm. you have. Yeah. Um, there's a component of just being in the now, mm -hmm. which uh, we usually attribute to uh, rich folks not having. And Solomon is included in that. Yeah. And, and that he says that several times, I think you see that phrase, eat, drink, and find satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And it's not, that's not about um, immediate gratification or looking for pleasure. It's about Enjoy your lot in life and where you are and make the most of it, right? The riches of people. Yeah. Yeah. Relationships and, and hard work and you know, those things that have substance to them. That verse about the sun shines on everybody, is mm -hmm. that in here? Is that in Ecclesiastes? I think it is. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's a, in chapters, end of chapter seven, or most of chapter seven, he kind of reveals his weaknesses problems uh, Solomon does from all of his pursuit of wisdom yes pursuit of wisdom is over pursuit even gets to a place that talks about the over pursuit of wisdom is not good yes. um, but also in his case uh, I think part of his downfall is women because yes. uh, the end of seven yeah under seven he's just like <laughs> women are just bad for him yeah <laughs> <laughs> He couldn't find a, a righteous one. <laughs> he couldn't find a righteous one. Out of all of them. Yes. And, but read right before that. One man in a thousand is no. Yeah. <laughs> but look at where he was looking. You know, he exactly. was uh, at all the pagan kings and their daughters, right? <laughs> 26. Seven times. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. Wow. Right. I nicely left that out. That's the one about, that's the one he's talking about. That's not about yeah. women, that's right. about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 Where, yeah. Is where is that? Is that verse in here? No, it's in Proverbs. That was a proverb. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying that's the one that he was talking about. Yeah, that's right, the same one that he's talking about. So here, here's another lesson I think we learned from Ecclesiastes 2 is um, for some of us, it's really hard to not be in control of everything. Right, and so, um, so that's a, a strong pull that we have to think that we can be in control of things. And then what Solomon is saying is, you're not in control of anything, so stop trying, right? And and so there's a piece that comes with that. Do you think about when you acknowledge that I'm not in control of the rest of the world around me, but I can control me and uh, and my relationship with God? And so, Amen. One verse that really made me think was. That when you read like 
oh my well, and I'll leave it to someone. How do I know that he's gonna be wise? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Even if it's your children that you're leaving your wealth mm -hmm. to, what are they gonna do with it? Squander mm -hmm. it? You know, mm -hmm. you don't know, mm -hmm. right? You know. Go Bill Gates on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give it away. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We'll have to consider that with our vast fortune. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So okay. let's just spend it. If you do it on worthy things, right? And not useless things. <laughs> or, mm. Anybody remember what the word is? What's the word for being here? Pebble. Pebble. Very good. Mm. Let's get another gold. I like right that there. word. I think I'm going to try to use mm. it. Yeah. And, and when you use it, think about Oh, mm -hmm. an example that it's, yeah. it's right. crazy. Use it around your children and see how long it takes them to ask you, what are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, that word. Yeah. Is that word you're saying? It sounds like heaven. <laughs> it does sound like Or a combination between heaven and hell. So hopefully we don't, you know, Ecclesiastes is not as gloomy as you thought. If you look for the good that's in right. it. Well, there's a lot of wisdom in it from a guy who went over the top. Yeah. <laughs> and said, don't do what I did. Mm -hmm. In 27, no, seven, no, sorry, chapter 12, no, 7 and 16. Do not be over righteous, neither be over wise. Mm -hmm. Why destroy yourself? Yeah. And then, um, my grandmother would say, don't get too big for your britches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know that one, Wayne. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And in 18, he says, it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. All extremes. Yeah. And that's what he, Solomon did not do. He was a man of extremes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Probably in almost everything he did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Paul would say, like, don't think more than you ought. Or, mm -hmm. Don't think of yourself more highly than you should. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I was reading an article this week about um, pastors and what happens to those who find celebrity. You know, sometimes doesn't it seem like most of the famous pastors we know have moral failures? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because pastors weren't meant to be celebrities. Right. Being over righteous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because then everybody um, puts you on a pedestal yes. and it's easy to think that you can be above accountability or that your um, passions are legitimate desires that need to be met or whatever. But, um, your interpretations of the word become completely something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was a young Christian and didn't know much of anything, anybody who was a pastor, I put on a pedestal mm -hmm. because I just thought they knew it all. And so as time went on and these people, I started to see their humanity it was a letdown. It was a major letdown. And I had to really, you know, get back, get, get into the word and figure out, wait, something's wrong with this picture, you know. Mm -hmm. And like you said, those who were in, you know, um, celebrity pastors, you know, in the fall of so many of them, it just, you know, I used to work for one that that happened to. And, and it was just... It was just weird yeah. to, to think that they're standing there telling me all these things and what do they do? And when they go back to their office, give yeah. me a break. Hmm. You know, and maybe maybe they think if people, so many people are listening to them that it just inflates their ego is a lot. And the sad thing, they're pro they're gonna be judged harsher than we are. Yeah. Well, and I think that it goes also throw the non-celebrity ones, not big, but right. respected people. Those too. Yeah, um, absolutely. They kind of go off the rails for a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that humanity piece. We got a little bit of early in our pursuit yeah. since we were both adults. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that many years in when we, since we were getting serious into the ministry, we started figuring out pretty quick that yeah. what happens away from the pulpit it's very different than you would have thought. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's Sometimes. why and that's why we have to stay oh, yeah. grounded individually. <laughs> Not at our house. Yeah. 
I'm yeah, just saying that each person has their own relationship to build with God. We can't base it on the person who's standing behind the pulpit or even the other people that you're mm -hmm. conversing with and talking about the word with. You have to work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. Mm -hmm. Our friend Rocky used to say, follow the master, not the pastor, you know, mm -hmm. and hopefully That's you right. can follow both. But um, yeah. You know. Well, but the pastor isn't the person your faith is based on. No. It's a tour guide. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think one, um, politicians come to mind too. Mm -hmm. That like in America, our politicians are supposed to be representative of the people right. who put them there. And then we find that they really have very little connection yeah, sometimes. That. And what? they get too big for <laughs> their <too. laughs> What? Well, I, I think we uh, have to remember that if you get put on a pedestal, just remember, you can always step off of it or fall off the pedestal. Uh, oh, and many you get knocked off, isn't it? Yeah, or you can get knocked off. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that's um, a good reminder about Solomon and that um, he had everything. And it's kind of sad, but, but we can still learn from him. Yes. Right? Yes. Oh, yeah. And so he calls out accurately what needs to, needs to happen. He just eclipsed it yeah. cool. all right well thank you guys for sharing your wisdom anybody else have anything else to say about ecclesiastes mm -hmm. next week we'll be talking about the song of solomon and greg's going to teach that for us <laughs> 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 I haven't memorized. Just kidding. Oh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> he preaches it to me every day. <laughs> so you can write and ask me which son, which Wednesday he should take the, the guys out. You know, <laughs> like that would have been better next week. I think. But, uh, okay. So we'll see what happens then. Let me, um, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Thank you for joining us.